When you're looking for a new home or investment property, why not seek an almost 30-year experienced businessman and real estate professional who loves the cultures of Chicago and understands the Chicagoland housing market? When you choose Ford Desired Real Estate LLC, LaShawn K. Ford will answer all your questions about securing a mortgage and providing valuable information for your purchase. LaShawn's house hunting kit includes a detailed summary of area schools, nearby amenities, and testimonials from homeowners who live in your neighborhood of choice. LaShawn knows this city better than anyone and can expertly consult you on property values. He'll take the pulse of your prospective community by highlighting neighborhood activities and notable facts. To list your property or to start looking for your next investment property, call LaShawn at 773 379 Four six six three. That's Ford Desired Real Estate LLC at seven seven three three seven nine four six six three. Is it okay if I open up with a quote from Dr. King? And it is sort of set the tone for what we agreed that we're going to talk about today. And Dr. King said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I mean, what do you guys think of that quote? I mean, it's forever. Um, it's forever lasting in our souls and in our society, but it means something different to everyone. Mark? I feel like the white guy shouldn't be the first to go on this one. But... <laughs> I think, but I think Dr. King wrote it for, well, he wrote it for everyone, but he had to write it because, you know, there are many white people who think otherwise. Yeah. And, and you know what? I'm not sure I agree with Dr. King on this one, at least probably not for the first hundred years. And we've talked about this before, uh, and I'm excited to talk about it within the context of what we'll be talking about. But to me, um, the color of one's skin is very, very important. As I said, positive action. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I, at this point, I think we have some back rent that's due if you're white skinned um, and uh, if you are brown skinned, uh, you've been probably paying more rent than, than you have to uh, in terms of being in this world. The bottom line is, is that I, I uh, yearn to get to the place that Dr. King dreamt of. Uh, I don't think we're there yet and until we get there, we don't have the luxury of uh, ignoring skin color. Oh, but you know what, can... Mark? I, you know what? You know, I hate when you get me to agree with you. <laughs> because, and then to get me to agree with you on a Dr. King's quote, when Dr. King could do no wrong in my eyesight. But I think that if we want to advance society, I think that we might consider whether or not we should judge a person by their color so that we can promote people that have been um, suppressed and oppressed in society. That's a very good analogy and position to take. But all right, I'm not going to go all in. I still agree with Dr. King. I, I do too, but then I look at you and I and I think, um, LaShawn Ford, uh, when you look at LaShawn Ford, part of what you have to consider is the color of his skin to understand just how important it is that the place he got to, okay? Right. And uh, I think that that's a perfect example, uh, lived experience, as we, something we talked about. A lot of times, lived experience goes with the color of your skin, but... Uh, Malika, I'll shut up now because, uh, you know, uh, Beyonce has got to have her say. <laughs> Should I put my fan on? <laughs> I saw the hair blowing. <laughs> I, now no. it's, a, it's a matter of Beyonce and Marilyn Monroe. I saw the hair blowing. <laughs> 
Well, I'm, I'm sure, well, Beyonce isn't, you know, she's younger than I am, but one day she'll understand the, the, the need for the fan. <laughs> Other than performance. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, read, it, read it to me one more time. Yeah, Cause you I'll all read. always get me thinking about things other ways. Read it to me one more time. Yeah. So that's a good idea. Dr. King, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Mark almost had me Malika, but I came back because <laughs> black lives matter. And we're going to talk about that. <laughs> what, you know, so Malika, Black mm. Lives Matter. I mean, so what's the, what's your idea about this quote? Black Lives Matter, comma, T-O-O. No, no, the Dr. King quote. The Dr. Yeah, King quote. yeah, I, you know I'm what? just saying Black Lives Matter, comma, T-O-O. Black Lives Matter, too. Yeah. Let me just say, let me just point out one thing. Uh, we have Black Lives Matter because the, content of one's character quote didn't come to fruition right right um right. i uh, i get i get what dr king was saying i i get how mark is saying it too um i think god made us different for a reason not to uh put anyone down or below anyone I think God is like one of the, not one of, he is the greatest creator, uh, the greatest artist. And he made us different. And he did that for a reason because I believe we all bring something to this world, to this life based on our, our culture. Um, and there's, there, I'm a black woman, there's beauty in being a black woman. And I love it when people lay eyes on me and, you know, expect positive, not put these negative stereotypes on me that they've created in their own illness um, or ignorance. Um, but see, wow, she is a black woman. Her history is so rich and deep. I don't mind being judged like that. And um, yeah, a person's character most, most definitely because you know, it doesn't matter what color you are. If if the character is twisted and not right, <laughs> it just is twisted and not right. It doesn't matter what color you are. But um, he made us, God made us different for for a reason. And, and I would hate for people not to see that beauty up front and just ignore it. You know, when people say they don't see color. I'm like, oh, what a horrible way to live. Yeah. But I, I believe I believe I believe uh, in color blindness as a medical condition, but not as a social construct. Right. Exactly. Right. That's what Dr. King. Um, you know, I don't know. You know, I think Dr. King, his his quote lives on today because we today have to also worry about black lives every day. And I hear you, Mark, and I hear Malika, where his quote says, judge them by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. But what's happening in society, we're being judged by the color of our skin. That's the problem. Every day. It matter. And here is W.E. Du Bois, the great thinker and human rights activist. He declared in July 1900, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The question as to how far differences of race, which shows themselves chiefly in the color of the skin and texture of the hair, will hereafter be made the basis of denying to over half of the world the right of sharing to the utmost ability, the opportunities and privilege of modern day civilization. And here we are in the 21st century, history is currently being made with the Ukraine crisis because of Russia. 
mm-hmm. in Beijing. And we need to make sure that the history is told accurately and it's told in all facets where we have a complete history. That's what's going to make it accurate. And one, I don't want the Russians, all Russians, to be stereotyped as bad people because the leader of Russia has invaded Ukraine and are treating people inhumanely. But there's something happening because of Black people, because of the color of Black people's skin in Ukraine. And those people are being denied Mm -hmm. access to humane treatment in Mm -hmm. Ukraine. And so you guys have um, been watching and reading this. Black people are being denied the right to get on the bus. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What's up with that? It's because of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. I got some accounts for you all this morning. We'll talk about them. Mm, mm, mm. In 2022, you, yeah. I mean, you, you would think that that wouldn't, that wouldn't happen, but I don't know, it's, you know, you have a, you have a lot of people out there that don't believe things like that actually go on in the world, period. And yes, hello, wake up. Yes. Yeah. And I don't <laughs> want people, I don't want people that's of Russian descent, Mark, to be labeled and stereotyped in Chicago, in Illinois, or anywhere in the United States because of their heritage, because of their lineage. They shouldn't be. We need to make sure that we, at this point, judge people by the content of their character. There are Russians out there protesting and being arrested. So yeah, they're, they're willing to put their neck out there, risk their life for humanity because it's not right what's happening. So, I mean, um, Mark is a beautiful spirit. Um, I have another, I know several Russians, beautiful spirits, and they do not agree with what is happening. Absolutely do not. One of the things that I wanted to do uh, was to put this uh, into context uh, for you guys, because it's a slightly different view from where I come from. Um, And so what I want folks to understand is that there are any number of levels of complexity. First, let me say this. Discrimination, prejudice, racism, different treatment based on the color of one's skin, unless it's positive action, is all wrong, okay? Let me put that out there and that is unequivocal. And so some of the things that I'm gonna say are not excuses, they're just going to put this into context. One of the things to remember about Eastern Europeans, particularly Ukrainians, Romanians, Bulgarians, the Polish, uh, keep in mind when I grew up in Moscow, the capital city of the former Soviet Union, I'd only seen one black person ever live in Moscow, okay? We had neighbors in our Tell us what, at what time, at what year that was, and how old you were. Sure. So uh, let's say um, late seventies. Uh, I was uh, I was born in seventy, so I was you know eight, nine, ten years old. And the only black person I ever saw, and I didn't know him, but was a, a, an African student, and there were you know a goodly number of Africans that did come to. Russia to study from um, uh, places like Angola, which was a communist country, but also from places like Cuba. Um, And so understand that it is very different having prejudice if you've grown up around, you know, if you go to the mall and see black people once in a while, (laughs) you are much more experienced with black people than anybody in Russia or the former Soviet Union. So it's not that prejudice is wrong, it's that there is absolutely no familiarity at all. It's completely strange 
because Eastern European countries did not have indigenous black populations. And so anybody you see is highly unlikely. I'm not saying there aren't any because there was a few uh, black communists who came moved from America to uh, Russia uh, sort of around the time of the revolution and, and World War II between that time. But most people in Ukraine have probably never seen a black person other than on TV. Okay. And when I was growing up in Russia and Moscow, there was only three channels. They were on from, let's say, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. <laughs> there was static the rest of the time. And so the only time I might have seen a person of a different color, well, that's not true because we have people of different colors in the republics. Uh, but the only time that I saw a black person, an African person, was one exchange student who lived down the street from us and was married to a, a local woman. And so for me, when I was growing up, um, whenever I saw this individual, I was staring. I was staring because that, that was completely new and different. So number one, understand that the type of prejudice um, is, is uh, bred by uh, all the prejudice and bullshit that's fed through the regular media that people see. Um, they see who plays, you know, the bad guys in American, um, you know, crime shows. Um, and, and that's what a lot of the experience is based on is the lack of personal familiarity. The other thing to think about is that uh, there is, so what's happening is, is that foreign students, African students and um, student East Asian students are, are having a hard time uh, evacuating Ukraine because they're being treated so poorly at the borders uh, and uh, being discriminated against. And that is absolutely true. One of the things to keep in mind though, is that it is the same kind of discrimination that we have here that may be based on passport and not only color of the skin, okay? One of the things that we are all privileged to have that some of us don't acknowledge because you know, it, it's never come up, but one of the things that I don't take for granted is my American passport. Uh, so to some extent, the way you get treated as a refugee um, is based not on the color of one's skin. In foreign affairs, it's also based on the color of your passport. The blue American passport is recognized around the world as a first class ticket. Yeah, I'm it a allows... I don't, yeah, I wasn't there. I'm still disagree. It's based on the color of the skin. Uh, you, uh, you know, you were, I, everything you said, I cannot accept that it's not based on the color of the skin, but um, go Oh, no, go it's ahead. very much based on the color of the skin. It's just based on lack of personal familiarity as opposed to American racism. Oh. But it's not any better. Uh, believe me, I'm just saying there's a different reason for it um, that's fed by cultural norms, the media more than any personal interaction. Most uh, Eastern Europeans, most people in Russia have never talked to a black person. You know, directly. that's right. But guess what? Let me just tell you one, let's make sure that we put it in perspective and say black, white, brown, doesn't matter, human. That's what we got to look at. These are human beings. Therefore, who cares if you've ever encountered a darker skinned person? treat every human being as a human being. That's why, I mean, just think, they've, they've never seen, some of these people never seen a giraffe or an elephant, but when they see the giraffe or elephant, they're treated kindly. So, I mean, that's what I would think. They're not gonna throw stones at it. They're gonna, they wanna feed it. They wanna treat it good. It, you know, that's just a, a, simple, a simple way of putting how they would treat an animal versus a human that they've never seen. But I wanna go back to one thing that we discussed before, and that is the culture and the imagery that's portrayed of black people. Because Mark, you're right. When, when I see things happening and black people being portrayed in certain ways in America, when I see the, um, 
the writers for movies and people that put on Super Bowl programs depict Black people in a certain way, that's a part of the imagery that people see all over the world. And you know what? Guess what? They see it in Ukraine. They see it in Russia. And that's who Black people appear to be to them. And that's what we have to fight against. We have to make sure that we have the right imagery of Black people in the world's eye. And it's, and it's so interesting because the imagery that's portrayed about white people comes off pretty evil and demonic at times, but black people don't approach, people of color don't approach white people in that same way. It's, it, it, it's just really interesting. Or they'll portray Latinos in a, in a certain way. So then everyone around the world thinks all Mexicans or people from Latin countries are a certain way. Um, it, 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 it's, it's just really interesting to me. And then you have, um, you know, with, with history, history tells us that the black people were the, were the first on the planet, um, but that doesn't get talked about. It doesn't get discussed. Um, but if we, we have a song or a movie or a TV show um, that shows just one element of us, there's, there's, there's various movies and TV shows about Black people. Some are really positive. So, you know, you'll have the Cosby show. Let's not talk about Cosby, but the Cosby show <laughs> that depicted this very positive, successful Black family. And then, you know, you have some other shows. So you have like the Real Housewives of Atlanta. Then you'll have, you know, a, another positive Black show. You have, it, it just shows all our different, you know, levels and, and elements. We're so creative. We're, we're all types. We have our evil. We have our professional, our intellectuals. We have our artistic. We have everything. But yet the focus is always on just, you know, bad black people or, 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 or something, but, but they, you know, and, or they'll look at Real Housewives of Atlanta and just think, oh, that's how all black women are. No, you have all sorts of examples. You have Michelle Obama, you have all sorts of examples, but they'll just say, oh, they're all NeNe Leakes from Real Housewives of Atlanta. And we're not like, I'm not anything like NeNe Leakes, you know, but you'll have, I can walk into a job and and white women will automatically think that, oh, she's sassy. Oh, she's angry. Oh, she's, you know, that gets put on me like right away. I, I do have to say that again, <laughs> number one, I said it before and I say it again, um, anything that's happening there is wrong. Each human life has intrinsic value, equal intrinsic value. And so, you cannot say, um, you know, no, we're not going to save you, take you from the bomb shelter uh, because you're black or brown. Uh, it is absolutely wrong. And the, but I will say that when, like, when Malika just spoke, she spoke very much of American racism, of of of, of American zeitgeist. It's. Um, if you walk into a job in Moscow, they're not going to think that same thing of you because they're not going to have that deep an experience to form the same kind of prejudice as, a, as an American prejudice person has. Understand that we're all, our brains are set up to be communal and tribal. So one of the things that our brains do is group things that are alike together that we know from psychology, psychiatry, biology, because we needed to early on in our evolution identify foe versus friend and anything that is most similar to us was identified almost at a biological level as friend versus somebody that something that didn't look like us being identified. So again, people make these groupings and it is very unfortunate the only thing that I can say is that I would distinguish the prejudice and racism in America. Um, 
I would say uh, prejudice and racism is based on familiarity or perceived familiarity. Whereas in Eastern Europe, the prejudice and racism is based on complete lack of familiarity and strangeness in it. So you're not, you know, again, if you're looking at an African, you're not even distinguishing that they're African or African American, because I think that representative the, the experiences you've mentioned have mostly been around foreign students in Ukraine. Um, and so I think an, an African American with an American passport would get treated differently in that situation than an African exchange student. You may and be again, right. I, I am not saying it's any of it is good or acceptable or excusable. I'm just saying that these are totally different kinds of racism. One it, based on perceived uh, familiarity and one based on complete lack of familiarity. You may be hmm. right, but I would tell you that there's no doubt, and I, I have some counts here that I'll like to um, talk about, and you're right, it's those students, people that's being discriminated against. But let me, before I go over those accounts, you know, Malika, you were saying uh, the way Black people are portrayed, you know, and and how things that we do spill over, the negative things that we do for entertainment spill over to our culture, and it hurts us, and it puts a stain on us when people see us, because that's who they say we are. When you think about acid music, you're doing drugs on the stage, doing, but that's never associated with the culture of white people right it's entertainment but we right. black people just don't have the luxury in america <clears throat> to have entertainment not impact our culture yeah why and we we need to have another discussion about that as to why that is i mean because based on what we see in entertainment when we see a white person we should think that they're serial killers they do acid they do meth um, they worship the devil. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> all sorts of horrible, demonic, evil things. Um, but we don't. Look, we, right we, do judge, we do judge them by their character. And when they act a fool, then we respond. Right. Right here in Chicago, <laughs> right here in Chicago, you have the home of guess who? Who who is the gangster guy um from Chicago? Al Capone. Al Capone. That didn't spill over and say that white people are gangsters. How did that but, not but, but it did spill over into people saying and having a lot of prejudice around Italian Americans. Ah, okay. Mm. Okay. So again, this is just to say part of, you know, Italian Americans are enraged when the Columbus statue uh, gets removed from the park because they see that as an insult to their heritage. And, uh, you know, um, uh, it's not, all of a sudden somebody is, ah, they're, they're just acting like mobsters or, you know. <laughs> so uh, there is, there is um, uh, I, you know, the, I often say, cause I'm Jewish, my wife is, um, I'm wife, my wife is Catholic, so I often say Jews invented guilt, Catholics perfected it. Uh, and and um, how did you all come together? Love <laughs> brings an, people an, together. An, an interesting story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they didn't um, judge each other. They went off the their character and fell in love. <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> or was not it arranged <laughs> not initially it was very much a judgment and it was harsh uh, but, uh, but in any case uh, I, I guess I, I will just say that all of us harbor some prejudice okay? that's right and, uh, and uh, by the way you know you mentioned genres of music uh, acid rock being one and those sort of headbangers and headbangers. all that's been associated with that and you know I, I will tell you I'm probably more prejudiced against people like that than I am in any notable way have prejudice in race, right? So it's not like 
prejudice in and of itself is not the same as racism necessarily. So I'm very unlikely to assume that I'm going to hang out with country music stars. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you give me the option, I'm much more likely to gravitate to the hip hop stars. Right. If those are my two options. And uh, that's a form, uh, you know, I, I just know that the country music folks aren't my crowd. So I, I like country music. I, and, and that's great. But again, th this is just to make the point, we make all sorts of groupings and classifications in our head. And all of us have different likes and dislikes. And I just think that we need to distinguish for people sometimes those that are natural and okay and those that have been manufactured yeah and encouraged okay because yeah. none of this happens completely in a vacuum mm -hmm. uh and and so a lot of you know there are differences between myself and trump voters <laughs> okay um but that doesn't mean uh that i'm gonna you know deny somebody being saved from a bomb shelter because they voted for Trump. Uh, although I'm not necessarily likely to hang out with somebody who voted for Trump. And so I'm just saying that to, you know, to, to my wife and myself, we look at a Trump voter and in some ways we're prejudiced, we judge. How could yeah. you do that? So yeah. I think all sorts of discrimination and, and, and racism exist. Um, and not all are based on the same factors. That said, none of them are right. That's right. Yeah. And let me go back to the Italians. Okay, let me. Let, can I just say something about Trump yep. voters? That speaks. Yep. That does speak to character. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> well, come on now, uh, Hillary Clinton <laughs> calling them all a basket of deplorables. Um, you know, not all Trump supporters are um, deplorable, are they? That we we'll just um, leave that there. Um, but Hillary said that you know she said that they are a basket of deplorables. But you know let's go back to the Italians and their statue. I support protests and I support people fighting for what they believe in. So the Italians put to deal with that statue. I support their fight. Now, I don't know whether or not everyone feels that way, but I respect everyone's willingness to fight for what they believe in. Now, if, if it's bad for humanity, then we got to shut it down. You know, but I, I do um, believe that the Italians should be listened to and they should have a voice in what they believe is right and wrong. And there should be a serious debate in the city of Chicago about this. And I think that when we shut them out and not allow them to really project their beliefs and have a debate so that we can measure the truth, then that's where we have a problem uh, in society. Because I see that often when um, the marginalized people's voice is shut down at least let them speak and prove them wrong. That's what it's about in America. So that's what I, I think. I have a question, but I think Malika was unmuting, so I'll save it for a minute. Oh, no, I was actually waiting to hear what, <laughs> what you were going to respond to. Um, I, I think that's a tough situation with the, um, just as an example, with the Italians and the statue. Um, and it's interesting because here in Evanston, we just had an event where uh, two Native American women came and spoke. And, um, you know, it, it's it's powerful, the, the stories that you hear that's happening to um, to their people today. It's, it's horrifying. I mean, they're getting raped on their reservations. They can't call the police. Um, they're coming and being kidnapped. Um, so what was happening to them back in history is still happening today. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how that's how that's going to work because the Italians, you know, they, they want their statue. Um, they want to recognize um, 
Columbus Day, the Native Americans absolutely do not. They see him as a terrorist, <laughs> you know. I don't know. It's, ooh, ooh. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty much, I'm going to say it. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. He's not actually a terrorist. He's worse than that. He was genocidal. Um, you know, <laughs> he killed hundreds of thousands of people, um, perhaps open the door to millions of people being killed. Um, I don't, you know, I think terrorist is too uh, easy uh, a label for you. Maybe monster is more like it, but then, you know, you get into somebody's head and you wonder what they were thinking. Um, uh, I, you know, I doubt he was thinking he was a monster, right? Uh, but let me ask you this. because How could he not think he was a monster? Oh, you'd be surprised how <laughs> compartmentalized things are. Uh, like Putin doesn't think he's a monster. Hitler didn't think he was a monster. Well, that's exactly right. They think they're, you know, brilliant ahead of their time st strategic leaders. That they're conquerors. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And if, if they write history, they're not going to be monsters. Mm. Right. Exactly. If they were, you're right. The founding fathers of the country that we live in wrote the history. And you know what? They were powerful and perfect. That's what it's about. That's what we talk about writing history accurately, making sure that everyone's at the table to tell the truth. And I'm not defending anyone. I'm not defending the Italians. I'm not defending anyone. I'm defending humanity. And the only way to get to the truth is to have an honest debate. Remember, the Italians, Blacks, Whites, Asians and everyone have been miseducated in America, in the world about the true history. Therefore, what Italians believe about uh, Christopher Columbus is what they've been taught. That's why we have Christopher Columbus Day in America, because he's a good guy. Right. That's what history told. So if we want to. Yes. So what are we going to do? We're going to suppress the fight of the Italians? Or are we going to deal with the truth and reality so that they can know and all of us know the reality about it? But if we don't have the discussion and we just shut them out, then we will never arrive at, at a perfect accounting or almost perfect. You know, well, and, and, and they really need to look at that because when the Native Americans tell the story of what Christopher, Christopher Columbus actually did, you know, you'll have Italians to be like, yeah, but he did so many other wonderful, amazing things. But when you take a black person who does, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bill Cosby or, you know, he is condemned for the rest of his life. Like his legacy is over. Oh, I, I it's mean, it, over it, it, for a black you're, man you're, you're or woman. Right. You're more right than you even know you are. <laughs> Talk to an ex-con. Okay, right. That's yeah. exactly it. Their, you know, society treats them as irredeemable. Hmm. Don't right. you say uh, it? So you are literally right, not just figuratively right. Uh, we are ready to throw lives away. And you know what? Whether I agree or not that you should be in prison, I certainly don't agree that you should be treated like an animal while in prison. Okay. That yeah. just doesn't help anybody and it diminishes all of us as human beings. Mark, um, let me ask you, I, I do have one interesting, you know how I like to throw an interesting twist uh, on these conversations. I wanted to ask you guys something, if you don't mind. Um, uh, Mayor Lightfoot, uh, this latest stuff around the Columbus statue and against negotiations with the Italian community by park district lawyers and sort of the very uh, indelicate stuff that Mayor Lightfoot said about those negotiations dismissed them. She wasn't that necessarily um, uh, favorable uh, about, um, you know, the Italian community. She spoke in crass terms, etc. The bottom line is she wasn't very pleased that her park district was negotiating with the Italian group about the Columbus statue. Let me ask you this. Do you think Mayor Lightfoot would have been equally as dismissive and impatient 
with these folks had they been negotiating with uh, an African American group uh, rather than a Italian group? Do you think she would have been equally as dismissive and angry at her team that they tried to find a solution? Mm. It's a very good question. And all I could tell you, Mark, is that I hope that the mayor has what you call a North Star and she's consistent in her fight to make sure that she's fighting for everybody at the same level. And also that she um, has positive action, as you would say, for situations. And I would say, I can't say what she would have done in that case. I just hope that she would have the same fire in her belly about a black issue. And I, I would tell you what, what I think about her way of handling it, it was cruel to the employee in so many ways. And it's unfortunate, you can be strong and you can make sure that the task before you get done and you don't create injury to people while trying to do it. And the people that she actually was responsible for managing, they may be harmed for life mentally. And they've been wounded by her. And, and that's unfortunate. What say you, Malika? Well, I like the way Rep Ford put that. That is spoken how a how a leader should deal. You should not bring harm, more harm. You shouldn't make it where people can't uh, are afraid to even approach you with anything else. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I I agree with everything Rep Ford just said. But to make that for the record, Malik yep. agrees with everything Rep Ford said. <laughs> Oh, all right. On the, on this matter. Oh, okay. This is okay. Uh, it's, uh, I think we're out of time. Let's close on that. <laughs> so, so Mark and Malika, you guys know Laura Washington, right? Of course. She's uh, she is the Laura Washington from the Chicago Sun Times. She wrote today in her column, going back to the Ukraine and Russia. I want to give some account. So, Laura Washington wrote black. Americans, Indians, and other people of color fleeing war-ravaged Ukraine are being held back and abused at the border crossing because of their race. Desperate student migrant workers and others trying to leave Ukraine said they were badly mistreated and discriminated against at the border. There's one student, and this goes to your point, Mark, about some of the um, human beings that are being discriminated against. A student, first year medical student living in Ukraine said, she and other foreigners were forced off a public bus at a checkpoint between Ukraine and the Poland border. Forced off, already on the bus, forced off. That's unfortunate. Another Monsters. account. Monsters. Monsters, yes. Another account was more than 10 buses came and we were watching every one of the buses leave. We thought after they took all the Ukrainians, they would take us. But they told us we had to walk, that there were no more buses and told us to walk. The human being said, I was so numb and cold. We haven't slept in about four days. She added, there is no need for us to ask why. We know why. And she said, it's racism. I could give you another account. Another doctor who lives in Western Ukraine said, she spent more than two days stranded at the Poland-Ukraine border crossing. The guards there allowed the Ukrainians to cross, but blocked the foreigners. Mark, you said it's about foreigners. She told the New York Times, the Ukrainian border guards were not letting us through. She said in a phone interview, they were beating people up with sticks. They were tearing off their jackets, she added. 
they would slap them, beat them, and punch them into submission. It was awful. In the final, a 22-year-old French medical student told the newspaper, the Ukrainian army beat me up so much I couldn't walk. When I finally managed to enter Poland, the Polish authorities took me in straight to the hospital. How about that? And there was some other accounts that I want you all to know that there were even Russian people that stood up for the Blacks in this situation. And that's why we can't stereotype people because not all people are bad regardless to where you come from. Mm, mm, my God, you have just ripped my heart out. And all I have to say to that is, I guess some Ukrainians need to uh, really dig deep into some history and realize Black people were the first people on this planet. And that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Some Americans need that same thing, too. Yeah. And, and you know, I say that when you are in Ukraine and you are expecting at the same time to be treated fairly and to be treated humanely, but then you treat people that's dark skinned inhumanely. I don't know how you can explain. Well, I mean, look, th this is what Putin refers to when he says denazification, because, you know, traditionally, uh, there was a lot of prejudice, uh, you know, anti-Semitism in, in, in Ukraine. Can you explain that? I, you said a word. What, what did you say? Denazification. Putin. So that means he wants to get rid of all the Nazis in Ukraine. You know, the, the Russians claim that Ukraine is being run by neo-Nazis. And that's part of why they are going in there to sort of finish the job that they didn't finish during World War II, ridding the world of Nazis. Mm. And that comes from the fact that um, uh, white ethnic groups like Belarusians and Ukrainians had a, you know, they had battalions that uh, served with the Nazis to, you know, help load up Jews on trains to go get, be gassed at Auschwitz. Um, so there is a long, long history um, in, you know, in that white Eastern European, Belarusian, Ukrainian, Polish. Um, there, you know, there was a lot. Of, uh, there was a significant history of collaboration with Nazis to rid their countries of Jews, and to take over Jewish property, and to move into Jewish homes, and to, you know, plunder Jewish businesses. Um, I, I mean, keep in mind, the legacy of that is why I came to this country as a Jewish refugee um, in 1980. So it was, it was still, it was and is going on. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's sad because this kind of thing is a tinge. Um, and um, I will say that those kinds of stories hurt the Ukrainians the most, okay? That yeah. is who's hurt the most because as I get up from this conversation, at least for <laughs> the next little bit, I'm discouraged, I'm drained, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm embarrassed. And that is occupying the place in my brain where empathy begins. Absolutely, Mark, that's right. You know, and I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, and this is a perfect example why when people don't understand and mark i know you got something to say about this because we talked about it this is an example of why we have to say black lives matter you know this is why we can't say blank blank matters blank blank matters this is why we have to say black lives matter because no matter where you go in the world you see this happening to black people color of their skin, not the content of their character. Yes, yeah. And so I tell you, the message also is to my black people. We have to matter to ourselves too. 
And, you know, the killing that's happening in Chicago, I'll speak to that the most because it's happening all over the country. But in Chicago, you know, almost a thousand people were killed in Chicago. Countless people shot that didn't die, that may die, which would raise the number of people killed from uh, violence, from black on black crime. We have to make sure that black lives matter to black people too. And I pray for that. Let me, let, let me just say uh, this one thing that I think that one of the things we don't say enough to gangs and gang leaders in particular, and again, even that might show some prejudice because if I say that, I, I should say, you know, um, not all gangs are black or brown, right? But in terms of the black and brown gangs, which are active uh, in the murders, uh, a lot of the murders in Chicago, one of the things I think they need to be constantly reminded is that if they're going to be successful, they're doing the KKK's work for it. Okay. Gang leaders who order hits on You're their right own kind are Absolutely. doing the work of the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some people that believe that, you know, they that they're paying some black people to kill black people. I, you know, that's, that's a theory. That that is a theory, and um, you know, again, who brings in the guns? Who brings in the drugs? Who's who's offering this money so that people can eat? Who's yeah. doing that? Um, but I think you know, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, you know, for a time we were saying racism as a as. It, it's not as blatant. It's it's just this pernicious, uh, subversive thing. But no, it's still blatant on the surface, as you see, as Rep. Ford talked about um, what's happening over in the Ukraine. That's absolutely inhumane. And um, you have people like Bethany Frankel raising twenty five million dollars to send to the Ukraine. I'm wondering how much of that is going to go to uh, the black people over there trying <laughs> trying to get out. Uh, will they get any aid or, or assistance? Um, you know, parts of Africa that have uh, endured terrorism still today, they don't get that kind of money sent to them to, to assist them. Um, and and the, the, <laughs> the crime here in Chicago, you know, we really need to look at that. Uh, it's, to me, it, it comes down to an illness and, and psycho, uh, lack of self-knowledge, lack of self-worth because of what has been beaten into them about who they are. And again, I go back to if, if even our young Black youth, if they only knew you're the original man of the planet, what does that tell you? What does that tell you? <laughs> and and I yeah. think if they came to really understand that and love for self, they wouldn't pick up a gun and kill each other. But it was designed that way. It, it was designed that way. It's, for some reason, it's designed around the world to as right here to Chicago that to get rid of the black man. My um, <laughs> my um, next door neighbor right here um, at my house is uh, an African immigrant. Uh, and um, uh, apparently comes from uh, tribal royalty uh, back in Ghana. Uh, and uh, he tells his sons uh, something that has really, really, really stuck with me. And that is, you got to know where you came from in order to know where you're going. And to me, that just seemed really... Exactly. Here. But that's what Malika and I and Mark, you have been fighting for accurate history, getting it right, because you will not know your culture, you will not know your heritage. And not only will you not know it, to have the pride about who you are and where you come from, but your neighbor won't know your pride, your culture in your struggles so that they are able to think critically without critical race theory training. But because our history is written the way it is, 
we need to challenge ourselves to think critically. And sometimes it means critical race theory training. Mm -hmm. You know, Malika, I want to go back to your comment about we don't bring the guns and the drugs and all that in. I'll just say you're right 100%, but people, we must make the right decisions. I'm grateful to the Lord that I'm not hooked on heroin. It's in my neighborhood. They sell it sometime right in front of my house. Hmm. But I, by the grace of God, not hooked on heroin. We have free will as people. And my mother would tell me, no matter who you are, you know your left foot from your right foot because you put your shoes on the right way. So we know right from wrong. We're not gonna let anybody come into our communities and give us poison, give us guns, give us drugs and make excuses. That's why we're using them. That's why we're taking it. No, free will says I'm doing it because that's what I want. We know the conditions are bad. We know the conditions for black people are not what it is for Mark and his white skin. But the fact is you got one life to live and you need to make sure that you make the best of it, even in the struggle. So yeah, it's there, but it's your life, it's your free will. Yes, comes but, down but to is choices. It really, choices. But is it really representative? Uh, you mentioned your mom. You know, uh, it starts right there. Uh, and so I will just say, and I'm sorry, Malika, I, I, I cut you off, but I'm pretty passionate about this. And, and that is, um, yeah, free will goes only so far. Uh, you know, I think free will arguments uh, are arguments of people that ultimately want to find a reason for prejudice. Uh, you know, well, you knew better. You should have. You, should. you know, it's very, very different when you, uh, you, your opinion of heroin is very, very different if your mom's doing it with her boyfriend in the house where you're growing up. Okay, and so, uh, yes, it is free will, but it's also free will of many people around you, not just your own individual free will. Our thinking right now is influenced by a lot of factors. And so, uh, you know, think about if we shut down social media, some of the murders that are happening in Chicago wouldn't happen. Okay, because yeah. that's where the beefs come up. And so I just want to make sure everybody understands that free will is fine, but to the extent that free will determines the value or worth of people, that is one of a number of factors, including family, community, health, education, and most 15-year-olds or 17-year-olds who are going to get hooked on heroin um, you know, they're not, they're not there yet. I, I don't think we can start with their free will. I mean, you know, we should say to all youth, black youth included, you know better. That's you right. You should know better. Right. I agree with that. But ultimately, um, that only goes so far. I agree well, 100%. And, really and you have youth here in Wilmette hooked on heroin. I mean, heroin is big here on the, on the North shore. Um, but I don't know, it seems it's, it's posed differently for them. It's, oh, they need help. They're, they're, they're not well. Um, their, their family situation was, was bad. You don't know what, just because they have some money doesn't mean that they came from a healthy environment. So they get help and, and they're, they're given sympathy and compassion. Whereas, you know, the black youth who are making the choice to, to go on heroin, to numb themselves from their reality or what's happening in their home then it's like, well, you, you, you should have known better. Yeah, what, what, yeah. what role does mental health play in free will? Right. And you know what, let me tell you though, the thing about it is I'm not a pull yourself up by your bootstraps man. I know that society has damaged the black population and the black families. But what I wanna do is make sure that I send a message that you have a life that you gotta fight for despite mm -hmm. the challenges that are before you, despite the poison that they're putting in your communities, despite the fact that the educational opportunities are not equal to your counterparts, 
it's a struggle, but we can do it. But we can't have the mindset of losing and it's impossible because the odds are stacked against me. The odds are stacked against you, but you're a winner. You got to fight. Come out. We've seen it happen. We've seen you gotta fight. people come out of poverty and the impossible because they didn't fall excuses and because they had loved ones around them you know, surrounding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to support you in your thoughts to a certain extent, Mark. The surroundings, they did have people around them to give them the strength to overcome. But there are also people that didn't have anyone around them but negative influence, but they had the desire and the will to fight to win. And that's Mm -hmm. what we need. And Mm -hmm. so what are we going to do? This has been another great episode of Ebony and Ivory and this thing called Beyonce. (laughs) <laughs> Until next time, I'm LaShawn Ford. <laughs> Malika Gardner. Mark Pesakovich. And we'll see you guys again. Keep hope alive. <laughs> Fight. Fight for your life. Fight yes. for your life. Don't be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs>